Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamblett, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Thursday, July 11th. Good to have you on board, everyone. Hopefully you're watching or listening from to this episode from somewhere cool. The Annapolis, Washington, D.C. area feels like Death Valley with humidity lately. While it's popular for our old retired guys to meet like me to say we had the worst plebe summer ever, I think the class of 2028 is suffering at a very high level right now. Uh, we look forward to uh, having them in our house at Beach Hall in the uh, Jack C. Taylor Conference Center later this month when we have the midshipmen, the plebes come over in groups of about 100 or 120 at a time, and we give them a presentation on what the Naval Institute can do for them while they're midshipmen at the academy and then also while they're uh, junior officers and later in their careers. Uh, in today's episode, we're gonna talk about cyber threats and we're gonna take some lessons from how Hamas attacked Israel last fall. First, this episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, joining me in our virtual studio today is Marine Corps Major Stone Holden, who took third prize in the Information Warfare Essay Contest this year. His article is titled, The Soft Cyber Underbelly of the U.S. Military, and it appeared in the June issue of Proceedings. Stone, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be on the show and to chat to the topic. All right, well, I got to give a shout out to your parents just to start things off because uh, they get an A, play, a plus for naming their child. In my next life, I want to be called Stone Holden. Um, so tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. What's your MOS, current duty, duty station, that sort of thing? So I, I appreciate that, uh, the shout out for the name. My wife likes to keep me humble and give me uh, constant reminders that I probably get much further in life than I deserve because of the name. So, uh, But I'll, I'll take it and I'll, I'll go with that. So. Um, yeah, so again, thanks for the opportunity to be on the show. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I've listened to you guys for a while and I'm obviously an avid reader. Um, standard disclaimer, you know, everything I say is my own opinion, doesn't represent the DOD, the Marine Corps, or my unit. Um, but to, about me, I'm a, I'm a ground intel officer by trade, currently stationed in uh, Marine Air Group 29 down in uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina, um, where I'm, I'm really fortunate to lead a, a team of exceptional Marines uh, working hard there to identify and counter threats to the force into our unit. Awesome. And uh, what was your commissioning source? Uh, I commissioned out of the uh, ROTC program at the University of San Diego uh, back in 2013. Nice. Uh, and since then, I've been really fortunate to serve in a variety of positions from the tactical or strategic level, giving me a pretty broad view of the, the force and like, the scope of threats to uh, our Marines and sailors. Okay, well, let's jump into the questions and start with the events in uh, Israel, Gaza last year. Uh, 7 October 2023, Hamas carried out a series of brutal attacks on Israel. I'm sure all of our listeners are aware of that. Uh, but you point out in your article that what could not be seen in the TV coverage was the cyber aspect of those attacks. Can you give us some sense of what Hamas was able to do to the Israeli people and the Israeli military, the IDF, through cyber means? Well, first, let me just give some credit where credit's due. Uh, over to the team at Modern Warfare Institute. Um, excellent work there as well, scholarship. Uh, and right after the attacks went, it came, uh, happened, uh, there was a really great program uh, called What Was Hamas Thinking? And they brought on Dr. Michelle Gropi uh, from King's College London, who, who made some really interesting connections. You know, uh, he, he looked at the success that the Hamas attack had and its achievement its goals and kind of, you know, postulated that it was probably more than they wanted to. And uh, he tied that back to an extensive cyber campaign they run out of Hamas uh, for the decade leading up to the attack. Um, you know, he, he points to the fact that there are some very exquisite details in the intelligence that they you know, were able to target specific areas of vehicles, specific parts of bases and, and facilities uh, in, a, in a way that indicated they had a lot of really good information uh, to plan this. Um, and pointing back to that cyber capability, uh, you know, he, he would say this probably is a is a linked area. So, um, you know, readily I'll admit, and you know, he says so in his in his own discussion, uh, there is no smoking gun there, right? It's really hard to attribute cyber capabilities and you know where did that information come from. Um, and you know, there there's a possibility that somebody has that collection at a much higher level, uh, but I'm not aware of it. Um, 
but it, it's a reasonable assumption to say to like, hey, this this long cyber campaign where they were getting access to information from, you know, IDF soldiers uh, really facilitated some of their intelligence on the planning and execution of the attack. Some of the other things that you didn't see on TV uh, that we talked about uh, in the cyber campaign, uh, you know, that preparatory work over those 10 years, a lot of it focused on fake dating apps, uh, fake dating profiles, um, you know, really going after the, the oldest human weaknesses in the books. Uh, you know, people are always susceptible to honeypots and they, they use it very effectively. Um, you know, using those platforms and those, those uh, profiles to elicit information directly or infect devices with malware. Um, and, you know, they also made up uh, apps like fake World Cup apps, you know, aimed at uh, service members. IDF, you know, serving the front line who want to stay on top of the, the World Cup. Pretty, pretty uh, ingenious. And then along with that, you know, uh, the preparation work in the cyber realm, uh, they also did a really good job of coordinating layered cyber effects on their kinetic activities on the ground. And that's something that's really difficult to do. Uh, we've even seen, you know, you know, pretty high level actors like Russia struggling to do that in their invasion with Ukraine. You know, there, there's a lot of cyber activity, but does it layer up with what they're doing on the ground in a way that, um, you know, impacts the, the ground kinetic activities? And it's a very difficult thing for most uh, most militaries to do. So seeing the fact they were able to layer those things as the attack was going on was pretty impressive. Uh, for example, they had uh, fake rocket alert apps. So the civilians who were looking for information on where these barrages coming in and when should I expect them? Um, you know, there were fake apps that targeted them, you know, months ahead of time, but could now give them false information. They were targeting Israeli civilians with uh, text messages, you know, providing, you know, scary information or misleading information, uh, even hacking some of the signs, the road signs that are up, post, you know, from the Israeli government, trying to give people directions on what to do in the emergency. Um, so again, uh, pretty, pretty impressively like psychological weapon uh, against the Israeli people if you're trying to sow panic. And so what struck me in this was that they were not really going after the big guys. You know, the strategic infrastructure, they weren't really going after you know, the Ministry of Defense. Uh, they went after a much wider pool of targets that were probably less likely to be defended uh, than a military or government secure network. Yeah, so uh, a couple of things jump out at me from your response there. First one is I hear, you know, intel prep of the battlefield, that there was an ongoing cyber campaign, if you will, for Hamas for, as you said, a decade prior to the 7 October attacks. And in that time, they were able to use cyber means of collection to gather data, gather intelligence, uh, get a better understanding of uh, their adversary, right? I also heard um, you know, the, the ability to uh, coordinate cyber effects with, with actual battlefield effects. So as they're, as they're attacking with rockets or attacking through the fence line, um, being able to use some, um, uh, you know, some apps, some fake apps to uh, to to make the Israelis think that um, that that threats were coming it from different directions, perhaps, or at different times, um, and and so you put those together, and they really compound the damage done in the in the physical realm. Um, so I, I, that's just absolutely fascinating. Um, it also, I think you your your last part there, you said. Um, that they that the Hamas did not target Israel at a strategic level, tact, you know, uh, with cyber means, but they really went after you know individual civilians, citizens, and and IDF members, uh, and so that gets to the title of your article, the soft cyber underbelly of the U.S. military. So I, I'm sure there are lots of firewalls and lots of uh, you know, high tech systems that are, you know, protecting, I hope, uh, protecting the uh, the information systems around the Pentagon and around, you know, the U.S. nuclear command and control and those sorts of things. But I think the, the most important thing that jumped out of me in your article is that, you know, individual sailors and Marines and soldiers and airmen, you know, we carry around these sort of threat vectors, right? Our, our iPhones, our cell phones, um, on us all at all times, you know, we take them to sea with us now. Uh, and that, you know, that, that is the soft cyber underbelly, right? That is, Hey, we've got cyber capabilities, but also cyber vulnerabilities, um, on every single service member, almost 24 seven. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, can be pretty dangerous. So, you point out that the U S military has information warfare strategies. And those are important but maybe those strategies are missing a, a key aspect. And I think, you know, I just touched on that a little bit, right? So 
talk about that. Talk about that threat vac vector. Talk about how you know how should DoD perhaps and individual services be thinking about those things. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, you know DoD is a massive organization. All the services are also you know very large, and they're they're looking at large scale threats. You know from the from the doctrinal level, um, so we we tend to focus on the Russia, the China, the you know North Korea, the Iran, uh, and, and how do we defend our big networks for that? Um, but sometimes you kind of leave out the smaller fries, right? So again, uh, maybe not so focused on the terrorists capability to do cyber attacks, maybe not so focused on the transnational criminal organization ability to harm your Marines and sailors while they're abroad. Um, but again, you know, the, the Hamas attacks, not saying they didn't go after some of those military targets, but we didn't see the effects that we we saw with the, the individuals. Uh, and they didn't publish anything. They didn't broadcast that they were successful, uh, which you would kind of imagine they would if they had been. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a huge threat surface, right? You know, you have, uh, you know, millions of people employed by the DOD who carry these devices in your pocket, like you said, uh, you know, more and more connected devices every day, watches, phones, uh, personal laptops, things like that. Um, you know, they are not as exquisitely defended as our Pentagon or our zipper networks or nipper networks, right? These are not getting dedicated cyber act actors watching to see if there's an uh, intruder on the network. Uh, so, you know, many of those people who are walking around potentially compromised in the IDF probably wouldn't even known they were compromised. Um, or, or if they were, you know, they would potentially be too embarrassed, right? You know, you, if you're going to take, you, you've been on a dating app, maybe you're sending some photos that you might not be the most proud of. Uh, you probably don't want your boss to see some of that stuff. So if you think you've been compromised, how likely are you to take that into your boss and say, hey, I, I need to scan because I think, you know, I might have some malware on here. You're probably not going to do that. That's like pretty, uh, they're expecting a lot of somebody. And, you know, I think these actors are smart. They know how to socially manipulate people. They're going to put you in a position where you're probably not going to go in and and ask for help like that. So again, uh, you, you, a much broader surface area, much lower level of expertise in defending the network. Um, you know, a lot more variation in target. You know, if everybody's using an iPhone, it makes it pretty hard because everybody's got the same level of security. But you got different quality phones, different you know quality of user on there. Um, so again, you have a lot more threat vectors you can go through. Um, so you know, I guess my question would be like, what are we going to take from that as the DoD? Are we going to ignore that that threat surface presented by the all of our personal devices, the millions of personal devices, uh, you know, associated with the DOD every day. Uh, do we really think our personnel are so much smarter than their IDF counterparts, right? Who are getting catfished and things like that. You know, I've, I've had Marines who've gotten catfished in, uh, in, in a few of my units and it, it happens. So uh, I would say that we're probably, you know, going to struggle with the same thing. It's human nature. Yeah. Describe what that term catfish means, because some of our listeners might be not, might not be aware of it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, typical term for, you know, you, you think it's a dating profile. I think used a lot more in the civilian world where, you know, you think it's a, a beautiful girl, you show up, it's a overweight guy, he's kind of sweating in his basement. Um, you know, in a more military sense, you know, usually you, you, people, uh, you know, the oldest, we call it honeypots when it's in, in person, right? Um, yep. You know, you suddenly you go to a bar, you're overseas, and suddenly, you know, you're, you're pulling a, a 10 when normally you pull a three. You're very attractive. People really like you. You're like, oh, man, my personality is great in X country. But it's probably not right. They're probably there for a reason, right? You get money or get information, um, and so you know, same thing online, right? Guys, uh, guys and gals, right? They find these um, these apps, these dating sites, and suddenly someone knows their status or can figure it out, and starts listing information and things like that. Or again, maybe it's just a, a racy photo. Maybe like, hey, you know, I'd love to send you this, and um, you get it on your phone, and, and you really can't tell the difference, but it jailbreaks your phone, and suddenly you're you're passing information you didn't realize you were passing. This is not new stuff. This has been happening. You know, the Assad regime was doing this in Syria uh, very effectively, um, and it, it continues on the battlefield today. Yeah, in, uh, uh, I want to just pull the string a little bit more on that. Uh, after the 7 October attacks in, in Israel, uh, did, were, you, were you able to read anything about you know, how specific members of the IDF were catfished or were um, denied or disrupted or, or, or fooled uh, into thinking something you know, that they you know, perhaps shouldn't have or, or a course of action that wasn't the right one or that you know, they, they thought the threat was coming from one place and it re really was in another place? Uh, so again, I, I will say it's kind of hard to get the specifics of who did what, when, where. But right? I'm yep. sure there's a lot that's lost in the mass of the IDF. You know, a lot of people probably didn't report what happened um, or didn't even know, right? So uh, I think the, the tactics we saw Hamas use were really 
uh, fake profiles. So, you know, on a legitimate dating app, whether that's a, you know, Tinder or something like that, uh, you know, looks like a real person, either, you know, a listing information just by conversation. Hey, you know, what, what, you know, you're not gonna be here this weekend. Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to the front. Um, or, you know, again, that, that malware injection onto a phone, jailbreaking a phone. Uh, and there's, there's lots of different malware that can do this. I think the most famous is probably the Pegasus malware that came out of Israel, uh, the NSO group out of Israel. Um, you know, this has been seen to infect a lot of phones with, uh, you know, uh, journalists and things like that. There was a list released a few years back that discussed people who've been infected with that. And a lot of it were NGO workers and journalists, but you know, these, these are things that once they get out, it's very hard to control. Um, so, so that would be an attack where you wouldn't even know, right? You wouldn't necessarily have to click anything, or maybe you click on the, the image and your phone is now jailbroken and someone has access to things like your microphone, your, your camera uh, and the data, they can exfiltrate that. Uh, the other way, you know, besides just the, the fake profiles is the actual fake apps, which is pretty, pretty advanced, pretty clever. Um, you know, make something that looks like a real app and is targeting people. You know, you can, you can target a specific group, like a military group. Um, and once you download that app, like a lot of apps, you know, it might be on the app store uh, looking legitimate, but it's asking for a lot of your data. And most people don't read through that full list of things that says, you know, hey, you give away your, your microphone. What does that mean? You give away access to your camera. What does that mean? Yeah. Your location, your data, right? So people are giving this away and not even knowing it happened. Um, same thing with the World Cup app, right? Like, hey, you know, uh, people are interested in sports. Young, young men and women serving the military tend to like sports, right? And so if you're away from your family, you're away from your place where you'd normally watch that, hey, I've got an app to solve that for you. It just mm. happens to be a Mox flavored app. Wow. Well, uh, you alluded to this earlier, but uh, you, you mentioned that we we tend to think of the the big threats that you know China, Russia, North Korea, et cetera, uh, and perhaps some you know Al Qaeda uh, or ISIS to some extent. But uh, but maybe um, we we tend to think of the the online the cyber threat uh, capabilities of the non-state actors as being you know something less than. Uh, it sounds like that's you know that playing field is sort of leveling out, and that the non-state actors have access to tools and weapons, uh, IO weapons now that perhaps come close to the the, the threats that the state actors have. Uh, well, you know, I think you know with the state actor comes the weight, right? The weight of the resources, the weight of the capabilities. So you know, a, a people from China, PRC, or Russia, you know, they're going to have a much uh, the ability to marshal a much larger cyber attack concerted with a lot of larger amount of groups. Um, but what we are seeing is a proliferation of, of cyber capabilities and weapons that, you know, really probably would have been the domain of a U.S., a Russia, a China, uh, across a wider range of actors. I think there's a few reasons for that. One, like technology is democratized. Um, if you want to learn how to be a really good hacker, you know, you can go on forums with a laptop uh, and a Wi-Fi connection in a, in a cafe anywhere. And if you're interested in it, you can pick that stuff up. Um, you know, another piece that is really making it more difficult is, uh, you know, I think Nicole Pellroth, she had a really great book called This is How They Tell Me the World Ends, which is not exactly a, uh, an uplifting title. But she, she really dives into this world of cyber weapons uh, and, you know, commercial companies, uh, individuals who are just very talented hackers who find these, these exploits called zero day exploits and can build out packages that allow you to do a specific thing on a device. Right. Hey, I, I can help you jailbreak an iPhone. I can help you jailbreak an Android phone. And they'll sell these things to the highest bidder, right? And they don't necessarily care if it's a guy with a briefcase from North Korea, if it's from the United States, or if it's from the mafia or the cartels, right? If they have enough money and they're willing to pay, a lot of times they'll just sell it. Yeah, and uh, the the dark web facilitates a lot of those things too, right? So uh, one of the guys who works for me was a professor and, and will be a professor again in the uh, cyber department at the at the Naval Academy. Um, he's a retiring naval officer, um, and he's in a he's in a six month kind of cooling off period between his military time and his being hired back as a as a permanent military professor or permanent civilian professor. I take it back. Um, and he gave me a tour of the dark web a couple of months ago. I, I actually got to sit in on one of his classes at the Naval Academy with a bunch of midshipmen. But one of the classes that they teach the midshipmen now are they at least expose them to the threats that are exist that exist on the dark web. Like how does the dark web work? How what is the onion router? Um, and then when you get on the dark web, what can you actually buy? Right. And what we saw was, I mean, it's amazing. And, and we were trying to avoid certain things. 
um, but weapons, um, uh, hacking tools, as you just mentioned, uh, illegal drugs in amazing quantities and cap you know, I mean, prices and it was just amazing. So, uh, yeah, if you want, if you're a nefarious person or actor and you want uh, tools to do your trade, um, there's lots of ways to get them today, and it's uh, it's rather uh, rather concerning is a is a huge understatement. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So Stone, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, recommendations that your paper has. Uh, so, you know, what do we do about these threats? And you you offer several potential solutions. So let's run through those. Yeah, I, I think when you start hearing this stuff, I think my first instinct is to unplug my phone, take my laptop, throw it in a river and just like live like a hermit. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a real option for most of us, particularly not if you're in the DOD. Right. Uh, and the expectation is like you are connected at all times. If someone's away, like I need to be able to get a hold of you. That is the reality of today's DOD. So, you know, uh, I, I think we, we need to do a better job of, of not just telling people that there are vague threats out there, but telling them, hey, there's a specific threat. Um, I don't know when the last time you did the, the Cyber 101 training, um, but, you know, you do it every year. It's the exact same whether you're a first year or you're an admiral. Uh, one of my bosses uh, got, to, got to work for a great, uh, great admiral and, you know, he was doing the same cyber security training that our E3s were doing. And it just seemed kind of weird to me that, you know, you're in for 30 years, you, you probably know a thing or two, that you're going back to the same, okay, don't pick up a CD in the parking lot and put it in your, in your computer. Um, yeah. So I think we need to do a better job with that. It, it's gotten better in the last couple of years, it's been a little more focused, uh, but making it iterative, it's got to build, right? You can't just stop with the basics. Uh, and we should expect more of our people because they're on the front lines with that. So, you know, how do you, you know, go from the basics year one, add a little bit more to it year two, add more to it year three, and so on and so forth until you get someone who who understands as a leader much better the cyber environment that their Marines, soldiers, airmen, sailors are going to be operating in, whether they know it or not. Um, so, so I think that's that's step number one. We got to improve yeah, that that's training. Yeah, I want to put footnote that or, or foot stop it because you're right. You know, the, the mandatory, you know, cyber online cyber training that you have to take every year. Everybody just so, sort of, especially after you've done it once or twice, because, you know, it's the same thing each year. You roll your eyes and you're like, ah, <laughs> oh, OK. Got, and then you're like, as, as fast as you can, you tend to be just clicking through the training. Right. <laughs> so it's not training. And, and to your point, if it's not new, if it's not additive, if there's not new chapters and information and techniques and things that you're learning each year, then it just becomes redundant, sort of like, you know, click through training, right? So yeah, I think that's a really important point. It's no doubt, right? Like, yeah, of course, there's bad people out there who want to do things, you know, to hurt me. But you know, it's, I'm still probably gonna need my cell phone. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna need to have an email, I'm gonna need to use a computer. So what, what do I do about it? Right? So I think that's the next piece is, again, you need to train the specific, you need to teach people. Um, but then what are we teaching them? You know, again, the specific threats, but also, you know, as a Marine, you know, m most Marines have a bias for action. I don't want to be told there's a bad guy out there looking for me and you go huddle in the corner until they come find you. But that's not how we think. That's not how I want to be. I, I want tools to defend myself. I want my cyber flak and Kevlar that I can put on and go defend and, and know how to use it. You should train me because I'm going to be in an environment. I'm going to go to different countries. Uh, where I have a heightened cyber threat because I stand out in the in the crowd. You know, I've got a, a MAC address. I've got an I, you know, I've got uh, identifiers on my phone that tell me tell people that I'm not from here. I've got a lifetime of ad ad tech that can show that I'm not from this area, and, and savvy operators can pick up. I'm going to be relying on local Wi-Fi a lot of the time. You know, I don't necessarily want to use airport Wi-Fi, but that might be the only option I have to let my boss know that I made it safe. Um, you know, I, I think one of the recommendations that came out for recent exercise was that Marines should not take their personal cell phones, but buy a phone there, um, which is great. But as someone who's traveled to multiple countries, I don't have that kind of money. Phones are a thousand dollars now. Uh, we're going to expect our lance corporals and, and seamen to go out and spend a thousand dollars on a phone when they go to an exercise. Like it's not a realistic expectation. Yeah. So you, so you got to train them, you know, what are the tools they can use to defend themselves? Uh, and it doesn't have to be particularly fancy. Right. Uh, CISA does a great job. They have a list of free tools uh, ranging from beginner to expert. That, you know, you can go in um, and whether it's, hey, you know, you've got a spicy photo from someone that you're not sure if it's it's malware and you don't want to be, you know, the IDF. Um, you can take a link or you can take a photo and put it into a tool like VirusTotal. They run by Google now. Um, but, you know, you put it in there and it'll scan and say, hey, this has known malware on it. 
uh, and at least give you some kind of indication of like, is this is this something I should stay away from? Is this safe? Is this not safe? Um, you know, and really teaching our Marines and sailors how to have a uh, defense in depth mindset with their their cyber safety, uh, where it's not just, hey, I either have my cell phone on me or I don't. But OK, you know, maybe I don't turn my cell phone on in a foreign airport because there's man in the middle attacks where, you know, people are going to act like a Wi-Fi source or a, or a cell tower. And they're going to extract my data as I walk through. And I'm smart enough to know that now. I'm going to put this thing in a Faraday pouch that costs five dollars uh, and I'm going to wait till I get out of the airport to open it. Uh, maybe, you know, they, they're, they're going to the Internet and they're on sites like Have I Been Pwned, which shows you, you know, all your email addresses when they've been stolen and, and posted on the uh, on the dark web when they got your information. So, I mean, think about the number of accounts you have associated with your email address, you know, probably dozens and dozens, whether it's from yep. Home Depot or Best Buy or Amazon, right? Well, when those things get hacked, they don't always tell you. Um, I was hacked a couple of years back from a parking app. Uh, nobody told me and, you know, resulted in me getting my phone number stolen and a lot of issues. Uh, but, you know, going on and checking the site, have I been pwned? It shows you, you know, here's what got stolen. Here's the data that got leaked. It's on the dark web. Free website, definitely recommend it. It's on CISA's list. Um, but again, that's another tool that most Marines and sailors don't know to go check every once in a while. Um, yeah, so again, having that defense in depth where you know, you're building not just one layer of you know, security, what's your VPN look like? Are we expecting Marines and sailors to pay for a VPN themselves if they're overseas and they're trying to master IP address and, and encrypt their data? You know, for some of us, you know, 10, 15 bucks a month is not that much. Um, but, you know, again, for some of your junior enlisted guys, they, they might just look at that option and say, I'll take the risk. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know some guys who would uh, because it doesn't seem real. Right? Uh, right. If it's such a big deal, my boss would give me something to protect myself or, or like a, you know, a standard uh, antivirus. You know, you, the DOD has the home use program. You get a year of free home use, you know, McAfee. It's great. After that first year, you've got three more years of a contract. You know, is that is that Lance Corporal going to spend $100 a year on uh, antivirus? And that covers just their laptop. What about their phones? You know, I, I think uh, we're being a little bit short sighted on that. And it's, it's not that expensive to equip the force with these things. Like, hey, you're going to be in for four years, you get four years of antivirus. You know, you're going to be in for four years, you get four years of a VPN. And here's how you use it, you know, personally. Um, you know, if you start, again, People are going to use their phones for personal things. So, uh, you know, having VPNs, having, you know, uh, commercially available VPNs, commercially available, uh, you know, anti-malware systems uh, is going to be really much more effective than having a, a DOD solution for that. Thing. Yeah. And, and well, some some listeners might be thinking or some policy makers might hear that proposal and say, well, you know, who's going to come up with the money for that? Right. This is that's going to be expensive to give every Sailor, soldier, marine, airman, et cetera. Um, you know, a, a VPN and and McAfee antivirus protection for four years or for the entire time that they're on, you know, in service. But at the same time, what's what are the costs of every time that uh, you know a, a service member gets pwned, as you put it, right? Um, and 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 you know does get hacked and loses their identity. I mean, you know, as a leader, when when one of your marines has a significant problem like that, you know, it, it just eats up bandwidth. It eats up their time. It eats up your time a, a, as a leader and you got to fix that. Right. So uh, having that PPE, as you put it, uh, is a, it's an important thing. Having cyber PPE is a, is a critical thing that we ought to be thinking about in protecting the force uh, going forward. That's yeah, a really good point. Yeah, it almost feels a little bit like uh, Iraq 2003, you know, rolling into Baghdad with soft skin Humvees and, you know, not enough body armor. Um, yeah. It was, a, it was a cost choice, right? We have the technology to equip everyone with body armor, but it's expensive. And then we quickly found that, like, oh, the number one cause of death is a gut shot. And we could prevent that with body armor. Um, so, I, you know, this is a real thing. I've had Marines, you know, uh, 2016 down in the Philippines with my first platoon sergeant, you know, Adam Olfig, uh, within, you know, Hours of arriving on deck, he had someone, you know, pretending to be his mother, uh, reach out to him on Facebook asking for money, right? A criminal element, but still, like, hey, that can cause problems down the road. Yep. Yep. Uh, had a Marine get, uh, you know, sex extortion through criminal things. Um, and again, this is this is not stuff that doesn't happen or happens to somebody else. This is happening to our, our service members. Um, just, you know, what are we going to do to prevent it? Yeah, all good points. Um, 
Well, we're about out of time, Stone. Uh, any final shots or advice before we uh, have to log off here? Yeah, I, again, uh, thank you so much for the, the opportunity to, uh, to write and compete and, and also come on and talk about this. And I'm, I'm pretty passionate. I'm not a cyber guy myself, but I've, I've, I've seen the importance of uh, the cyber domain and the fact that it touches all of us. So, you know, trying to educate myself. And I would just say, you know, um, you really got to go out there and educate yourself. There's a lot of great resources, uh, you know, that are free or low cost. And I think waiting for the big DOD solution uh, eventually will come once we realize that the cost is, uh, is better to pay upfront than on the back end. Uh, but don't necessarily wait, you know, take, take your own safety, take your family's safety, take your unit safety into your hands and make sure you're doing the things that, that keep you guys safe. Um, that's, that's all I have to say, but I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, well, Stone Holden, Major, U.S. Marine Corps, thanks for writing for Proceedings and for being on the show today. Thank you very much. All right. This episode was brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers. Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. Your support is important to everything we do. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today by going to usni.org slash join. In addition to receiving Proceedings Magazine, digital and or print, our members also receive the new USNI News C-Scroll Weekly Newsletter, which is a member-only benefit filled with reporters, notebook items, and insights that don't get reported anywhere else. Well, that's a wrap for today's show. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.